Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Um, and yes, um, how to apply NIST SP 866 to meet HIPAA third party risk management requirements. Bit of a mouthful, but we'll uh, be breaking it down um, throughout the course of the next hour. Um, uh, as Melissa's indicated, um, obviously throughout the course of today, uh, if you do have any questions, please put them in the in the Q&A box. And then hopefully, uh, time permitting, we normally have at least five minutes or so um, at the end uh, to answer a few of those questions. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and uh, start the webinar. So the agenda for today, um, I've broken it down into sort of three key parts, four key parts. Firstly, taking a higher level view of what is NIST 866, before breaking down the other side of the coin and looking at HIPAA and what does the HIPAA security rule mean? What does it talk about? What the focus of HIPAA is, is, is all about? Then moving on from that, digesting what does and what can HIPAA mean when we're talking about third party risk? So using the HIPAA uh, security rule um, uh, when, when engaging with your third parties and using it as part of your wider uh, TPRM, your third party risk management program. Uh, we then step back and do a link between the both. So given what we've seen and learned about HIPAA and come some of the focus points of HIPAA, what does NIST 866 do? Um, how does it address HIPAA requirements and how does it complement, perhaps is the more pertinent word, how does it complement HIPAA um, as, a, as a regulation, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a requirement? Uh, and then finally, um, just looking at some next steps you can do, whether you're just starting out in your journey in, in TPRM, um, starting out your journey in, in HIPAA, um, or, or you're already uh, well versed in HIPAA and you just want to learn more about how you can utilize 866 uh, to enhance uh, your current processes and practices. So let's make a start on NIST. 866. Um, now you, you may see right at the top that I've included the word guideline. So uh, those of you who are very familiar with NIST um, will know that uh, as an organization, they produce a lot of different frameworks, a lot of different best practices, um, some focused on particular sectors and industries, um, others that are used quite widely across, uh, across not only the US, but multiple geographies as well. Uh, 866 has been designed specifically uh, to help businesses interpret and implement the HIPAA security rule or HSR. Um, I'll reduce it to HSR to make it easier to, uh, to discuss throughout today. Um, so while I said guideline, um, it's important to note, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate this throughout, throughout today, is that although we're focused on what NIST 866 can do, what it can bring to the table in terms of HIPAA requirements. It's always important to stress that it doesn't replace requirements from HIPAA. It doesn't uh, update or change the requirements. The focus is still very much on implementing what's required from HIPAA. It merely expands it with the best practices, with the uh, NIST's forte when it comes to information and cybersecurity. So always think of it as that guidance um, to, to, to enrich your understanding of HIPAA. It expands on key terminology and concepts that the security sets out for protecting EPHI, or electronic public health information. And it builds on core industry standards and best practices, for example, the risk management framework. And again, that's, that's, that's important to note. So I've highlighted that NIST has quite a large family of standards and frameworks um, in the similar way that ISO does for 27,000 and other notable um, uh, sort of frameworks and industries and sectors. Um, and 866 very much leans on that quite heavily, um, particularly from a risk perspective that we'll go, go through um, in a short while. Um, but outside of that, with some of its other common uh, uh, framework such as 853, 
when looking at um, identifying and discussing specific security controls and control groups, for example. Uh, so it's this, this, this overarching guideline to help interpret and implement the HIPAA uh, security rule, um, but very much taking the best practices, the knowledge, the forte that NIST brings uh, in terms of understanding uh, information and cybersecurity. So having taken a very high overview of, of 866 and something we'll come back to uh, in a short while, let's now take a look and shift our focus to HIPAA and the security wall. So at the top level, it's about protecting the confidentiality, integrity and availability of public health information. And it's important to note that, as you will find in many uh, frameworks, although it sets some clear requirements, some clear expectations, uh, some clear uh, uh, um, uh, control points, because every organization that implements it is going to be unique, and the way they implement these controls is unique. So a large organization versus a small or an SME business will approach um, uh, uh, controls and requirements in a different way. Um, and obviously, it's important to recognize that it needs to be looked at based on the concepts, based on the scope of, of the business and the complexity of the business. But nevertheless, there are some key objectives that HIPAA calls out uh, that should be maintained across the board. So firstly, ensuring the CIA or the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of public health information. So making sure that confidentiality of that data and information is obviously not made available to unauthorized persons, unauthorized processes, making sure from an integrity perspective um, that uh, the information is not manipulated in a way uh, that, would, that would corrupt that data, make it unusable or impact uh, the end uh, recipient of that information, the person who holds that information, um, and obviously making it available at all times. Protecting against reasonably anticipated threats and hazards um, and protecting against anticipated use or disclosure of EPHI that's not permitted by the HIPAA privacy rule. So, of course, we know we're focused on the security rule in this webinar and, and the relationship with with the uh, 866 uh, framework, but it's also important to recognize that. And of course, that there is a close relationship um, between uh, planning of information and cybersecurity and the protection of personal information as well. Um, and obviously there are rules that HIPAA has built around um, in a separate ruling called the HIPAA privacy rule that touches on uh, how EPHI should be maintained, accessed, controlled as well. When it comes to the protecting against anticipated threats and hazards, um, we will go into detail from a risk perspective um, and obviously being mindful of the typical or the common threats, hazards or vulnerabilities uh, that could affect uh, EPHI um, is one of obviously the first steps before going into the deeper dive of the type of controls that HSR requires an organization to uh, implement. And then finally, ensuring compliance of the uh, security rule by the wider workforce. Um, and so, again, not just looking at some of the technical details and some of the technical control sets, um, but also from the governance aspect as well. So those staff who are, are handling, using, um, managing uh, EPHI on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, and also thinking from a supplier perspective, um, whether our processes, systems that are outsourced um, um, in a similar frame, making sure that that compliance of the security rules is achieved um, by those outsourced partners, business associates as well. So those are the four key objectives of, of the HSR. And as I say, it's, it's regardless of the size and the complexity of the business, these four should always be at the back of your mind um, if you implement, particularly if you're implementing HSR for the first time, making sure when you develop those controls, when you develop the processes that we need, um, are we meeting these objectives? Are, are we confident that the controls that we've implemented um, are sufficient to protect that CIA of the information? Have we anticipated those threats that are the most pertinent? Um, based on what we do, the product and service we supply, or the the location geography that we're we're located in, 
um, and how we put the necessary checks and balances in place. Outside of those objectives, uh, the hippie security rule then breaks down into what we'd call two key aspects. The safeguards, which form the core activities, the core requirements for implementing uh, information cybersecurity controls and governance controls. Um, and then sort of underneath that, um, but you could also argue all encompassing, are the top level requirements, um, which largely evolve around those policies processes that are used to support those safeguards and requirements of the security rule. Um, so any policies, processes, working procedures to help complement uh, those security rules, whether it's access control policies, data security policies, um, policies around risk management, um, and everything in between. The safeguards themselves can be uh, split into three areas. We have administrative, physical and technical safeguards. So what are each of these? So when we're talking about administrative or rather when HIPAA is talking about administrative safeguards, it's talking about those actions, policies, procedures um, that are used to manage um, A, how you manage, how you select and how you implement security controls and security measurements. So the focus very much is on the governance side of the process. Um, you do see, uh, you will start to see that this follows a similar framework, a similar consistency to the way other information security regulations and frameworks are, are, are created and that we're starting at the governance admin side first, setting the scene and working out what controls we need and what, what policies we need before progressing to the physical and the technical capabilities as well. So from the physical, as the name suggests, protecting the physical information systems, protecting the buildings where those system are housed, systems are housed. So looking at environmental threats, looking at controls to protect against unauthorized access or intrusion, um, and looking at the wider scale of where your key uh, information systems are maintained. Uh, particularly those that are uh, storing um, uh, any aspect of uh, EPHI or health information. And then finally, the technical controls. Uh, so technical controls to protect um, uh, EPHI, um, which are quite broad and, and typically range from uh, data security to logging, monitoring base controls, so from data encryption to backup um, to, to uh, processes to measure and manage devices as well. Um, and so we have three key groups of safeguards, administrative, physical, and technical, um, that encapsulate the majority of the requirements under HSR. And then, as I said, from the requirements piece underneath, any designated and documented policies processes, procedures, work instructions that help support uh, all of those uh, security controls and safeguards. So what I'd like to do now is just go through in a bit more detail to understand more um, about those safeguards and, 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 and some of the depth and complexity um, um, of, of them. So security measures implemented are broken into three groups of safeguards. Um, each with underlying HIPAA standards, key activities um, associated on a function-by-function -function basis. So I mentioned administrative is more uh, of a governance piece, and you can see from uh, on, on the left-hand box uh, the type of processes, the type of requirements HSR is focusing on. So designated and designed security responsibilities, managing the workforce, whether that includes uh, managing the access of, of staff, of contractors as well, um, as well as awareness and training and, and, and areas that you need to teach employees about in terms of the protection of, of EPHI and related systems. And then some of the top level plans and processes around managing incidents, managing contingency, business continuity, evaluating your security controls and your wider security management system. And then from the business associate perspective, and this is one there that we'll focus on um, in a short while, 
Um, when we say business associates, we also mean third parties um, and, and other uh, related uh, suppliers. And so looking at how you manage uh, the security and the control of, of, of business associates, particularly if there's a strong reliance on them uh, in terms of, sort of managing or, or providing access to uh, EPHI. I mentioned physical, um, as its name suggests, is very much focused on the env environmental and physical protection. And so we're looking at the access controls or facility access controls where appropriate, uh, managing workstations, so the use of the workstations, the security that sits around workstations and key uh, operational systems, and management to controls to, to, to secure devices and media. So whether this ranges from uh, MDM or mobile device management, to applying appropriate controls to manage uh, uh, access, uh, antivirus, uh, anti-malware solutions, for example, um, or managing the disposal and reuse of such equipment as well. So really focus on, on, on physically securing those devices. And then finally, from a technical, as you can see, the five key aspects here around access controls and met method, methods and measurements around authentication. Um, audit controls, um, audits, event logs, uh, managing uh, system controls and methods to alert um, for any unauthorized access, data integrity, integrity systems, integrity management systems, uh, again, thinking about protecting the CIA uh, of, 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 of data, and then obviously transmission as well. So where there's a need to transmit, transfer data, say, from one system to the next, or particularly from um, internal to an external system, uh, particularly if you do have or work with business associates. And so there are controls, um, uh, security measures and security controls designed and identified um, uh, from a technical aspect there as well. So using these group of controls and procedures, obviously organizations do have a complete set of requirements with which to obviously assess themselves and to implement, but thinking about a third party um, uh, engagement as well it gives you quite a wide remit to assess a third party against, whether it's looking at all of the controls, all of the, all the relevant safeguards, or those ones that are pertinent to the nature of what that third party is providing to you as well. Um, so it really does help sort of set the scene if you're just starting out on your TPRM process um, and, and, and you're looking at HIPAA as, as a critical security um, sort of control group and review um, obviously to satisfy your own business and, and industry and sector needs as well. So quite a lot of detail that sits under the three uh, respective safeguards. So what does this mean generally to third-party risk? So if you think obviously three different scenarios here, well, one, if we start to identify, or we've already started to identify our critical third parties, whether we've profiled and tiered our third parties, we know who our critical third parties are in terms of those who are, are managing critical systems that are holding EPHI or where there's a need for us to provide them um, uh, maintenance of those systems or storage or transfer of EPHI on our behalf. Um, and particularly if we've identified those third parties that are using our own suppliers, so starting to think about the wider supply chain and the necessary supporting products and services um, that they, they may interact with as well. So obviously through HIPAA, and as we see through enhancements made by NIST 866, uh, these are now enable us to drive third party contract requirements. So again, if we're using uh, uh, the HSR um, as, as a key driver or as a key um, uh, enabler in our third party program, um, there are controls, there are requirements that enable us to focus on how do you manage, how do we set out a third party contract and the necessary security requirements uh, that, that wrap around that. Um, as shown on the previous page, it gives us the option to assess a third party against the entirety of the HSR. There's a lot of detail from understanding how third parties govern their infrastructure from a risk perspective, from an employee perspective. Um, as well as the physical and the, then the, the technical control sets as well. So it gives us two areas to either focus more from a contractual aspect in those areas that really matter um, to assessing the full end-to-end -end of the HSR 
um, uh, against each of our third parties as appropriate. And then finally, identifying critical questions and control groups that are relevant to third party requirements. And this is something that really sort of stands out within the 866, uh, sorry, um, is the way in which the framework provides uh, questions, provides areas to think about and areas to consider when you're looking at each respective rule. And I'll explain how this can be used in a few uh, stances both obviously for your own interpretation and use of HIPAA, but more pertinently and perhaps more, more importantly, how can you use them to drive those third-party requirements and third-party discussions to say, how are you implementing these controls to protect that EPHI that's important to us and important to our, our customers as well? So now we've taken a look at HIPAA, we've taken a look at some of the key high-level objectives and, and um, uh, the three key uh, safeguards, admin, physical, and technical. Now let's take a look at the risk piece. So I mentioned at the start that 866 um, uh, utilizes its broad range of uh, security frameworks, uh, including 853 and RMF. Um, so RMF stands for Risk Management Framework. Um, and we can already see from the outset within HIPAA uh, that there are risk assessment requirements that are established for, uh, right at the beginning in the administrative section, particularly with a focus for uh, implementing risk analysis and risk management. Um, risk analysis in terms of accurate and thorough assessment of risks and vulnerabilities and risk management in terms of implementing those security measures that are sufficient to reduce and manage those vulnerabilities and risks. Now, it's important to note that although 866 does have, focus heavily on RMF, A, given that there is a risk, a, a, a NIST framework and this standard, but it's also an, a, an internationally known best practice standard for risk management. It's important to highlight equally that um, there's no hard and fast rule with which framework to use. So although 866 does focus on the RMF, um, and as we'll see shortly, it does go into a lot of depth in terms of starting your risk program and your risk life cycle through to getting to the stage where you can record, analyze, and start implementing controls. Obviously, it's not the only risk framework out there. And it's important to note that because this is a guidance document, it's not enforced that every company must develop um, based on the RMF. If there are other frameworks out there, uh, such as ISO 31000 or other known risk management frameworks, they can be equally as applicable as long as it still meets those HIPAA requirements. But nevertheless, the NIST does focus on RMF and, as I say, for good reason. Um, if anyone unaware of RMF, I'd say it is a very detailed um, uh, assessment. It goes from the from the, the stage of setting a risk strategy, um, and and um, and and building and identifying key risk assessment concepts and processes. Um, but obviously, more specifically for for HIPAA, building risk assessment that I helps identify any condition where EPHI could be used or disclosed, and thinking about. Uh, the necessary threats and vulnerabilities that could be associated with that as well. So a framework for identifying, managing, monitoring, and reporting on third parties has it been established. And one of the key areas we see in 866 is it captures uh, these requirements in five key pillars. Prepare, preparation, identify threats and vulnerabilities, likelihood and impact, risk levels, and record an analysis on analyze. So in preparation for risk. So NIST 266 asks the question, so where is EPHI created, received, maintained, processed, or transmitted? Has a company got to the stage where it can competently and confidently say, these are all the systems and infrastructure where you can find and locate uh, EPHI? We've actually done a proper risk mapping and data mapping that shows the data flow between uh, individual systems. So we've got preparation where we're fully understanding the systems, the infrastructure uh, where EPHI is impacted, whether it's through storage or 
or, or use of, 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 of the information or through, through data transfer as well. Obviously, once you've got an idea of those type of systems, the complexity of those systems, the geographic location um, of those systems, we can then move on to looking at, well, what threats and vulnerabilities can we be focused on here? So what different threat events and threat sources? So thinking about threats and vulnerabilities, broadly speaking, we could trim it down into three key areas, natural, human, and environmental. Natural, um, earthquakes, floods, storms, hurricanes, uh, anything that's anything that could cause uh, any physical damage to to operations and systems um, and and to geographic locations. From a human aspect, anything that's intentional, identity theft, hackers, ransomware, um, uh, phishing attacks, and anything uh, of a similar malicious nature, but also unintentional threats as well data entry error, accidental deletion of data, um, uh, unauthorized, unintentional access um, through an individual uh, where they haven't been or, or, or shouldn't have been granted access. And then, of course, environmental, very similar to natural, that's more focused on power surges, power spikes, uh, any impacts from an environmental perspective uh, uh, that could again impact uh, the type of systems uh, that are managing or storing EPHI. So once you've prepared and got an overview of, of the type of uh, uh, systems and infrastructure that are controlling and, and uh, that are storing and managing uh, our, our health information, we've then identified the threats, you've done identified vulnerabilities in existing systems as well. Are we running systems that are out of date that no longer have patches applied to them are there there's some inherent risks that if left um could could result in a significant threat a significant loss of data in the similar vein to other management frameworks uh this 866 asks for consideration for likelihood and impact of the risk so how do you start quantifying these risks you've identified those most pertinent threats uh to the system or to the systems well, what's the likelihood that those threats will occur? And if they occur, what's the level of impact um, to, to the, the information itself and any related systems as well? And once we've got a clear visibility of that likelihood and impact, can we start to design and apply some appropriate risk levels? So levels of risks to the EPHI. Now, I'd say the, the RMF is quite extensive. Um, is quite extensive, um, and it does give uh, indication in terms of um, uh, different levels and how to scope and manage those levels, um, whether it's critical high, medium, low, um, or, or, or something similar. And then finally, the recording and analysis or analyze of the of the risk information. So we've got to the stage where we've identified and prepared, we've identified the threats and vulnerabilities, and we know what we would classify as, say, critical risk versus low risk. Um, now it's focusing on how you record those risks. So risk registers, developing risk processes, if you have an, a, a tool or a platform to help record those risks, um, that then enables you to do the ongoing review and planning. So establishing risk ownership, the uh, continual improvement and continual review process, um, obviously with the ultimate aim to reduce those risk levels to something acceptable. And then finally, obviously, plans through remediation. So the RMF and the 866 really sort of sets the scene and helps organisations to work out what steps, and it really is a step process, but what are the building blocks that we need to to start with, that we need to begin with, um, um, to make us aware of those 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 pertinent threats. And it's important to know here, although we've obviously focused very much on EPHI, obviously very much uh, third parties comes into play here as well. Um, so where there's visibility and understanding of uh, business associates that are used, where there are third parties who are maintaining or accessing um, uh, systems main, uh, holding that health information. Um, are we capturing that as part of our wider risk process? So moving on, 
the largest aspect of A166 and, and how it addresses and, and, and deals with HIPAA requirements is through two means. So it sets out each respective key activity, as you can hopefully see here on the left-hand side, that comes straight from the HIPAA standard or in the HIPAA requirements. But then it expands it through descriptions and sample questions. So it sets out that guidance for each requirement across the HSR and asks pertinent questions that organizations can ask when planning and implementing those controls. And this is where it gets quite uh, exciting and quite interesting as a framework because they can be used in multiple means, whether it's auditors assessing a business against HSR, using those questions to ask and expand on the activity and expand on the requirement, or whether it's an organization identifying, well, what questions should we be asking a third party when we're engaging with them? We know that they have a certain set of controls. Maybe there's a lot of data security based controls there, and we need to find out more around how they've applied and implemented those controls by using those sample questions, by using those enhanced descriptions. It can help for a more interesting, more value adding conversation with the third parties. Again, Important to note that despite these sample questions, despite the enhanced descriptions, these are NIST 866 guidance and not HIPAA requirement. Um, so they're merely as an aid memoir and a key thought process to help those decision processes, whether it's that due diligence of uh, have you thought of everything when implementing the control or that engagement with the third party. So spend a few minutes now just briefly touching on uh, three samples. Obviously, we don't have time to cover the full end to end of the of the HSR, but I picked out three different samples um, from each of the, uh, uh, I believe, from each of the respective areas um, from admin, physical and uh, technical. So sample administrative. So the control requirement security management process and ask organizations to identify all EPHI and relevant information systems. Well, what does that mean? We're well, taking a look at description and the way NIST expands on this. You can start to see it's drawing into almost the asset management style of identifying information systems. So do you know where PHI is generated within your organization? Have you identified the systems that are housed in that PHI? And does that include all range of devices, not just the back end systems, but any mobile devices, medical equipment, any Internet of Things devices, any other device that may have access or store that EPHI data or information? Have you considered software as well as hardware that's used to collect or process that type of PHI or even transmit it across systems? And have we analyzed business functions and ownership? and control of those system elements as necessary. And so you can see where the sample questions really come into their own and really help to generate that discussion is uh, when this is essentially asking organizations to say, have you considered this? So have you considered that you've identified every physical equipment and piece of software that's storing the PHI? Have you created an asset register of all of this information? Is it periodically inventory? Do you review it on a regular basis, particularly when new and emerging systems are coming in or there are changes to critical business systems? Um, have hardware and software that maintains or transmits that information been identified? Does it include all removable media, remote access devices, particularly more pertinent now, given that we're still finding more and more companies are still adopting a very much hybrid approach of, of working and working from home. And so there are typically more and more mobile devices uh, that are required or used um, and obviously that have access to that information. So are we cataloging? Are we capturing all of that information somewhere? So we've got a complete view, end to end view um of our systems and you can see this working in two ways from a third party perspective on the one side simply asking those questions and asking can you please explain how you catalog them can you please explain um how you're capturing all this detail and and and, and the frequency of review but then 
when you're looking at the fourth party and nth party management, so if your third party has an additional supply of its own, asking those questions as part of the third party contract, ensuring that there are relevant questions and due diligence checks asked from the third party to ensure that your fourth party is also managing uh, any assets that are storing or accessing EPH EPHI appropriately. So it really gives a few different elements and thought processes to how you can approach these, these, these key activities. Taking a look at some technical requirements. So technical requirements, including access and authentication, audit, control to protect the integrity of EPHI, EPHI and transmission of that information as well. So again, we're focusing on a particular activity within the uh, security rule uh, focused on integrity. So implementing procedures to address the requirements to protect EPHI from improper alteration or destruction. And so again, this sort of expanded this requirement to say, this is talking about identifying and implementing those methods that we use to protect from unauthorized modification and implementing tools or techniques uh, that, import, that, that, that support and enhance data integrity and, and, and assurance of, of data integrity. So again, thinking from a sample in question perspective, do you have auditing and logging capability? Are there control techniques to manage access of where EPHI is being stored? As part of that auditing, event, auditor logging, administrator logging, for example, do you have technical solutions in place as well that own, not only look at that event logging and report appropriately, but also detect any alteration of EPHI? So FIM or file integrity monitoring solutions, for example. The use of anti-malware, anti-ransomware solutions or systems, uh, to, again, to help alert or to help remove um, or minimize those threats. But then also, although we're talking from a technical perspective, have we thought about can the additional training of users decrease instances um, that typically are always attributable to a human error? As we know, human error, even to this day, is still one of the biggest risks um, in, in, in information security. And so that consideration of We've got the technical capabilities in place. You've identified the controls. You've implemented procedures that limit, um, uh, you know, disclosure um, or, or loss of integrity of, of information. But is there enhancements to the awareness and training programs that we give users um, so that they're also mindful of steps that they should be taking um, uh, to limit human error? And then finally, as an example, what does this mean for TPRM? So again, a quote from, from the HSR. Covered entity may permit a business associate to create, receive, maintain, or transmit electronic protected health information on the covered entity's behalf only if the covered entity obtains satisfactory assurances that the business associate will appropriately safeguard the information. It's quite a mouthful there. Uh, what do we mean by um, business associates? Well, again, the focus is very much on, uh, there's a few areas it could contain, but where we're focused on, it's third parties, suppliers, vendors. Um, and it's where the organization is using an associate to help support a particular aspect, supply a particular information system or product or service. Um, and then again, particularly where they come into, into, into contact with uh, a PHI. There are a few controls that are focused very much on managing business associates. Um, one of them is business associate contracts and other arrangements. So have a written contracts or other arrangements been developed? Is this documented satisfactorily or do you document the satisfactory assurances required by the standard through a written contractual arrangement that meets all of these applicable requirements? What does that mean? When engaging with those associates, those vendors or suppliers and third parties, have you got formal terms of agreement that not only say the due diligence of what they're providing to you and how often and the frequency of providing that, but the information security uh, requirements, any requirement that's coming directly from HIPAA, from the HSR, 
are they captured within the contract? You may find a lot of similarities between the way that HSR captures information around managing business associates and associate contracts with other notable frameworks, such as 853 from NIST and even 27,001 from ISO, in the, in the sense that the expectation is on identifying those associates in this case, um, identifying uh, where there are information security controls that need to be captured, identified and communicated, um, and recording them as part of the written contracts and agreements um, before uh, starting uh, work with those with those associates. So where does NIST expand on this? Have you identified roles and responsibilities? Do you include requirements in the associate contracts, um, particularly addressing the CIA of health information? And are there any particular training requirements based on the contract agreement and arrangement? So again, those extra descriptions and the way that NIST expands those descriptions um, just gives you more uh, understanding and background around either A, how you implement that control and the areas to consider, or from a third party perspective, how you engage with that third party in more depth um, and, and uh, any particular areas that you ask them. And they're looking at the sample questions finally. So again, does the agreement specify how information is to be transmitted to and from the associate, for example? So if you were using a, a third party um, to, to store um, EPHI for you, they've got particular systems and solutions that securely store that. How is that being transmitted? Is it electronically? Um, is it through other, other means? And if so, have you agreed through the contract how that security, how that notification and authorization process works for securely transmitting that information. Where clear responsibilities um, are identified, but where roles overlap, um, does that need to be called out? So are there instances where both the organization and the vendor um, take joint responsibility over, over um, uh, particular controls? For example, if hosting PHI in, in the cloud environment, who has ownership there in terms of encryption? Is it the third party? Is it yourselves? Do you both address it in some capacity based on the type of solution, software, application, the way that information is being stored? So and this is basically saying there's a lot to think about in terms of the way EPHI is stored and managed and where it's being used by those third parties. Have that conversation with them. Um, have that conversation around we need to satisfy ourselves that you're doing all that you need to do um, to make sure that EPHI is being protected. And then again, thinking about the wider supply chain, do we need to go that one step further and saying, well, you're committing to us these controls that we both agreed in the contract, but there are enhancements to these controls or the same controls that we need you to impress upon your supply chain or at least you need to give us the confidence that they're having uh, parity when it comes to uh, the controls uh, that this the, our fourth party, um, your supplier, has implemented. Um, and there's parity with, with, with what HSI is, is saying and what it's, what it's expecting as well. And this continues across the, the whole of the uh, 866, where it's taken down each individual uh, key activity. Uh, that's required from HSR and expands it both on description of what the activity is talking about and those due diligence questions that you should be considering. And let's say the applicability of this and the, the range of how this can be used is, 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 is pretty large, um, whether it is that due diligence, that auditor uh, validation, or, or whether it's simply to have a broader conversation with uh, the end organizations or parties responsible for securing the information, uh, whether it's yourselves, third parties, and, and anyone else down the line. And as I say, you'll see this across each individual question um, uh, that's captured. So two key areas to think about. A strong focus on establishing that risk framework um, captured as part of uh, HSR's um, uh, review or requirement of conducting risk analysis and management, but then from a NIST perspective, using a recommended best practice framework, such as the NIST RMF, 
uh, to really have a strong, uh, cohesive process to managing that risk. Um, and then outside of that, from a step-by-step -step process, looking at key pertinent questions that we could be asking ourselves um, and our third parties when it comes to well, how do we implement the HSR requirements um, and what level of due diligence uh, should we or have we considered? So addressing the third parties in the, or specifically the third party supply chain. So 866 has been designed to help businesses interpret and implement the HIPAA security rule. Uh, through the use of these guidance notes, through the use of expanding the control sets. It, the use of sample questions, as we've seen, to drive that further discussion with third parties or to enhance contracts and agreements. Um, and an extra focus on business associates and where appropriate if there's contracts with those associate subcontractors as well. So thinking about the wider fourth, fifth, nth party supply chain. Um, and that's really the big, uh, I think, the big takeaway with, with A166. When you think about it from, well, how does this impact our third-party process? Or if we're starting our third-party process, we know HIPAA is important. We need to implement HIPAA. And we need to demonstrate that uh, uh, HIPAA rules and requirements are being uh, uh, implemented successfully, particularly within our third-party group and our other supply chain. Um, A hundred sixty six is really just giving that extra help in terms of what questions and discussions are we having, or should we be having with our third parties, and how we can use uh, the the security rule to help shape those third party contracts, and not only shape the contracts, but particularly from the risk framework as well, the RMF concept, um, to help manage the end to end of the risk process. So the use of um, tools, for example, to capture risks and, and, and launch assessments or launch uh, discussions with third parties um, by having a clearly structured framework and process in place allows us to capture the end results of those risks um, on a vendor by vendor basis um, and then obviously manage them appropriately as well. So making sure we've got that clear structure and governance framework from the outset um, and then and then expanding from there with the appropriate all-encompassing HSR control set or controls that are relevant based on what the third party is doing um, on product and service it's um, it's providing to us. So thinking about that, let's take a look at next steps and and an overall summary of what we should be doing if we're just starting out in the process, or if we're at the stage where we've been running a third party program for some time and we've got, and we're looking at, do we need to review it? Are there other questions that we should be asking ourselves? So firstly, it's about understanding that third party landscape. So identifying those third parties who you have access to provide or supporting systems that contain uh, EPHI, public health information. Once you've identified those third parties, conduct that risk assessment based on the RMF, based on other uh, recognized risk frameworks, but using the benefits of 866 to help drive that structure and that, that um, uh, sort of improvement to risk strategy. So conduct those risk assessments to determine all critical risks associated not only with the use of EPHI, uh, but that are linked back to third parties. So we can start to scope the areas of the HSR uh, that we need to be focusing on or the type of risks that we, are, we should be concerned with. And then review the HIPAA security rule in combination with 866 guidelines to help identify those core control groups and questions that are relevant to third party services. Again, it could be all encompassing. Um, more often than not, however, there'll be certain questions um, uh, that you'd want to ask or certain security requirements that are more pertinent than others based on what the third party does or how close they are to accessing, storing, managing, transferring EPHI. Honestly, once you've got to that stage where you've understood third party landscape, we understand the full or the overall scope of applying 
a HSR assessment or HSR review on our third parties and using that 866 guidelines and key questions to, to have that conversation with our third parties. It's then establishing those key contract requirements and engagement and actually start to engage with them as well. So what HSR requirements or HIPAA security rule requirements should be captured within our third party contracts? Are there some default uh, areas that we should be focusing on? Are there some very unique controls um, uh, that we need to impress upon our third parties? For example, controls around the technical um, uh, uh, technical safeguards that focus on data security, logging, monitoring of systems. Should we be focusing on those? Um, our physical security, um, uh, physical safeguards, less of a concern for us or do we still need to um, ask that question given the scope and complexity or geography of our third parties and obviously you then start to do the identification and assessment of third parties using that hsr framework whether it's through questionnaires surveys and assessments um, and processes to obtain that information so when you're getting back those risks you're comparing it to the hsr requirement using again this 866 to drive additional questions, have we done due diligence, using it almost as an auditor's tool um, uh, uh, to ask those validation steps. Um, and then it starts the continual, uh, uh, to use an ISO term, a continual improvement process. So that continual review of third party risk um, uh, uh, across the wider third party risk management program. So that's a quick summary of, of the areas that we've discussed. Hopefully um, uh, that's been enjoyable, that's been clear. Um, hopefully it's been insightful as well in terms of looking at what 866 is, how, how it's used or its purpose in relation to the HIPAA rule. And, and, um, and I guess the, the key thing to always remember, as, as I stated from the outset, that it's used or should be seen to complement the, the, the security rule to be used as uh, strong guidance, um, um, being as it is coming from um, uh, an organization that's very well versed in, in information sky, cybersecurity best practices. And, and there's a lots of really good, uh, useful and, and, and interesting questions that it asks uh, organizations to consider. And then let's say that relationship with, with the wider uh, NIST frameworks and standards, such as 853 and, and RMF, um, um, to, to name it a few. Uh, before we go to uh, questions and answers, I believe my colleague, um, Scott, will be uh, going through a few slides. That's right. Uh, thanks, Thomas. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, everyone, for sticking in with us for the last hour to review some of the most important information we can, you know, consume and reflect on and determine how, you know, it would impact in our environments um, in applying some of the most important security and privacy rules uh, to the protection of data. So that's great. Thank you, Thomas. I just want to take a brief moment to explain, you know, how prevalent can help address some of these situations. And you can move to the next slide, uh, Thomas. Thank you. Um, at the end of the day, when we talk to customers, customers tell us, tell us they want to accomplish three things with their third-party risk management programs. Number one is get the data they need to make better decisions, because right now that data is typically fragmented in different systems or feeds or tools used by different departments throughout the enterprise. Second, uh, they want to increase uh, team efficiency by breaking down those silos, as I mentioned, where some of that data and, and information is housed. So that ultimately they can achieve, you know, the third thing, and that's to evolve and scale their program over time, help to be prepared for when new suppliers are brought on board or when you have to off offboard uh, existing suppliers to tighten up the process um, and make sure, you know, they're they're you know they're ready for the next thing. Better data, knocking down uh, silos that keep you from achieving your goals, and then ultimately helping to to grow your program over time. You can move to the next slide, Thomas. It, that's that's what prevalent delivers across every stage of the third party life cycle. And Thomas, you can click out two more times uh, to, uh, to finish the build, there we go, to finish the build on that slide. You know, whereas a lot of, 
a lot of organizations maybe look at um, third-party risk management at the time you onboard a vendor or the time when you have to recertify them or, you know, go through renewal process and do some contracting. You know, we recognize that third-party risk extends throughout uh, an, a relationship from the point you source and select that vendor to the point where you offboard them. And we deliver distinct capabilities at every one of these stages uh, to ensure that those needs are met uh, across that life cycle. And that includes the collection and analysis of, uh, of uh, key control data that helps to support, you know, uh, HIPAA and uh, NIST 866 uh, framework requirements. At the end of the day, the objective is to help you simplify and speed up your onboarding process, give you a single source of the truth in a process, uh, to help you streamline the process of assessing vendors and close gaps that you might have in intelligence and unify your teams uh, across the third-party lifecycle. Next slide, please, Thomas. We deliver that through a combination of our expert third-party risk management managed services, uh, where we go and do the work of collection and analysis against these requirements on your behalf, supported by some of the best data available in the industry to help validate those controls and provide feeds and insights in areas maybe beyond cybersecurity. And then third, give you a platform to house, manage, control, report, uh, and, uh, and share that data throughout the enterprise so that everybody's on the same page. Next slide, please, Thomas. Um, you know, I want to offer everybody access to a checklist that we've written that maps a lot of what Thomas talked about today in the webinar uh, in the HIPAA uh, security rule requirements and how NIST 866 helps make that easier uh, into a kind of an understandable framework and then maps best practices capabilities, including some prevalent features uh, into how you can use that framework and use, you know, those best practices to help um, you know, help improve your program. So watch for that link uh, in the follow-up email when you get the recording uh, of this presentation as well. Next slide, please, Thomas. And that's all I wanted to share with you today. You know, the outcomes of what Prevalent helps you deliver is, is, a, is a smarter third-party risk management program that includes very comprehensive risk sources, data-driven analytics to help you prove compliance, uh, and then uh, role-based reporting to extend that throughout the enterprise, a unified approach, to bringing teams together around a single source of the truth and then very prescriptive process to help you move through the life cycle of managing the vendor and through your compliance and auditing and regulatory reporting process. That's it from my perspective. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. And we are pretty much at the top of the hour. So I'm going to launch our last poll, um, which is just asking you, hey, are you looking to augment or establish a TPRM program in the coming months? I know budgets are getting established for 2023. So um, maybe you're in that same boat, but be honest because we do follow up. It's not just for our health to do two polls in a in a webinar, but um, you know, we have about 30 seconds left. I think Thomas gave us some great insight, uh, what to expect in this upcoming year for healthcare organizations specifically. And, you know, make sure you guys fill out that last poll question before you get out of here onto your next meeting. Um, and I hope to see you all at a future webinar. Take care, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks, all.